Today we're going to be continuing on our discussion of sustainable agriculture. And under that heading we're going to talk as well about agricultural pests and what kinds of procedures are available for controlling pests and diseases in a sustainable kind of a way. Now we've already talked a bit about some of these things and looked at some pictures of these but let's review them again and then we'll look at a few additional examples. Other things that can be used in a sustainable agricultural system include things like crop rotation. It's not a good idea to plant the same crop in the same place year after year if it can be avoided, especially with vegetable crops. If you plant the same crop in the same place year after year, it gives insect pests and diseases an opportunity to get going in them. Whereas if you move the location in which you plant any particular kind of vegetable from year to year, it helps to keep populations of insect pests or other kinds of pests from building up and it also prevents or reduces the probability of other kinds of disease organisms from becoming established in the soil or on the remains of last year's plants and that sort of thing. So Crop rotation is one procedure for minimizing pest problems. Another kind of procedure involves composting. Now composting is done for a number of reasons. The principal reason being to recycle nutrients back into the soil. But also by composting in a hot compost system, the remains of plants from previous years, the heat of decomposition will destroy a lot of pathogenic kinds of organisms. Another part of sustainable agricultural systems is mulching, where hay or grass clippings or something of that sort is put between rows of crops, thereby protecting the soil from becoming established with weeds. It also protects the soil from the heat of the sun, so it keeps it from drying out. We've looked at some examples of this in a previous program, and we'll be looking at some more examples in just a minute. So mulching takes the place of herbicides. And also in the spring, when we till in the mulch from the previous year, it adds to soil structure and as it breaks down it also provides additional nutrients for soil reducing the need for mineral fertilizers. Another technique that's used quite a bit especially in corn fields in the Northeast and in other parts of the country as well is planting what's referred to as green manure. It's a fall crop like winter ryegrass which is planted so that after the corn has been harvested in the fall, it will continue to grow into the fall. And then in the spring, this young grass can be turned into the soil. And again, as it decomposes, provides some nutrients. And also it adds again to soil structure, helping water holding capacity of soil and things like that. So let's now go back and look at pictures of some of these sorts of things that we've talked about so far today and in our last program as well. We're looking here at soybeans and beans, bean relatives, peas are all in the family Fabaceae and all have associated with them root nodule bacteria like we talked about last time. And so by planting pea relatives, we can help to nitrify the soil and again reduce the amount of mineral fertilizer that we need to add to the soil by doing so. So 
Soybean is a good crop for doing that. I plant soybeans in several rows at different places in my vegetable operation every year, in part to harvest the soybeans, but also in part to help to keep the soil nitrified. Other kinds of crops like that would be garden peas and other kinds of beans like stream beans and lima beans and that sort of thing. There's quite a few pea relatives which are typically grown in vegetable farms and vegetable gardens that are good choices for keeping the soil nitrified. Another thing that I do is it is possible to buy the kinds of bacteria that inhabit the root nodules and to inoculate the soil with it. So to make sure that I have good populations of these bacteria, sometimes I will also spread this bacteria into the soil to help keep all my plants, all my pea plants, well supplied with that. Now another aspect of sustainable agriculture that we talked about in our last program was the issue of contour plowing. And here you see a hillside in western Pennsylvania that has been contour plowed and planted to crops in a manner that conforms to the contours of the hillside. This is important in terms of reducing soil erosion. Now a topic that we've also discussed in previous programs has been that of compost. And here we're looking at my compost pile, which is referred to as a cold compost operation and that it is not confined and the temperatures within it don't build up to extremely high levels. Although indeed they do build up to high enough levels that they can even melt snow in the winter time. What we're looking at here is the early spring, late winter compost pile where I've begun to pile up dead remains from corn stalks and things like that from the previous growing season. That provides a carbon source. And then during the growing season, as I weed and pull up plants and that sort of thing, the green materials and associated soil that comes with them all get stumped on top of this, providing a nitrogen source. And between the two, the heat of decomposition will break this stuff down and provide a rather nutrient-rich material that I can then spread upon the vegetable operation the following year. Usually it takes about a year to produce, at least at the bottom of the compost pile, a good supply of compost ready to be put back on the garden. Now one other image I wanted to show, we looked at a similar kind of an image in our last program is this one. To again point out mulching between vegetable rows and you can see between these rows that there really isn't much in the way of weeds coming up here but it is covered with grass clippings. We'll come back to that white sheet and some of the weedy stuff in the foreground in a bit. which are also parts of sustainable operations. One other thing I might point out while we're looking at this image is that of crop rotation. On the left hand side you'll see a spinach crop and the following year instead of planting spinach in that place I might plant some sort of a pea crop. Now over on the right hand side just before you get to those tall things with the white flower heads. Those are last year's onions, by the way. Just before those, there's a crop of soybeans, young soybeans, and those are planted in an area which the previous year had something else there. I think there was broccoli there the previous year, and so these soybeans are helping to re-nitrify that soil there and also they're producing a crop of soybeans to be harvested but then the following year they would be planted in a different location where they could again produce a crop but also help to re-nitrify the soil.
Now let's turn our attention to our principal topic of today, which is agricultural pests and disease. Diseases tend to be caused by fungi, bacteria, and viruses in vegetable operations and pretty much any kind of agronomy kind of an operation. These would be the principal disease agents. Pests would include insects, but also other kinds of organisms. Things like slugs and nematodes, which are a kind of worm. Certain kinds of mites, which are spider relatives, as well as larger animals, vertebrates, mice and voles and rabbits and raccoons and a whole host of other kinds of small, medium-sized mammals and even large mammals. White-tailed deer are a huge agricultural problem in much of the country and things like bears and moose can also become problems in vegetable operations depending upon what kind of crop is being grown. Of course, raccoons pretty much just focus on corn, for example. Now, pests and disease, of course, are not just a problem for plants. They're also a problem for livestock. So chickens are notorious for being affected by a number of kinds of disease organisms. Things like avian influenza is a particularly serious one. Bird flu. When it's transmitted directly from chickens to people, it is particularly virulent. And then there are a whole host of diseases that are just bird diseases like Newcastle disease. Chickens also get parasites like feather mites and there's a particular kind of lice that just affects birds so they're called bird lice. Cattle diseases include things like brucellosis and coccidiosis and trichomyiasis, which is actually a parasitic worm infection. Bot flies are flies that lay eggs on the surface of the skin and then as the larvae develop they, they burrow into the skin. Both cattle and sheep and other kinds of animals are, all, are also susceptible to liver flukes, which are another kind of a parasitic worm infection. Now, if we talk about plant diseases, several of which we've already discussed, we could add some of our principal agricultural crops like corn. Corn is susceptible to a whole host of different kinds of insects. It can have stem borers that actually invade the stem and earworms which invade the ear of corn and then there are various kinds of fungal infections that will affect the leaves of the plants. Tomatoes are also very susceptible to fungal infections, notably early and late blight. Late blight in particular is a major problem. It from the onset of infection to the death of the plant is a matter of a week or so in many instances. It is something that there's quite a bit of research being done on to try to control because it so severely reduces tomato harvests when it gets established. There are chemicals that control it, but organic means of controlling late blight are very limited and so there's a lot of work being done on developing blight resistant varieties. Another common issue with tomato plants is tomato hornworm which are giant caterpillars that can just strip the leaves from a plant in pretty short order. Although they are eminently more controllable in smaller operations, just hand picking them is a way. Although one thing that I do 
which is involved with, as we'll see, integrated pest management, is to leave a border of weeds around my vegetables, which serve as habitat for parasitic wasps, which lay eggs on the backs of the hornworms, which as they develop, kill the hornworm. So I've had very few problems with hornworms in my tomatoes, and I plant an awful lot of tomatoes. The hornworms are pretty well controlled by the parasitic wasps. One can also buy parasitic wasps to inoculate one's garden with. So let's focus specifically on this topic of integrated pest management by looking first at this picture here. This is a picture of my part of my squash operation. What you're looking at in the foreground are winter and summer squash plantings. Typically you plant squashes in hills and the plants being vine-like spread out from the hill to into the surrounding area. Now this is a spring picture so most of these plants have just started to spread out and you'll notice a lot of open space in between them that's covered with mulch. My idea several years ago was that by mulching underneath the plants that this would help to keep weed problems down and help to keep the soil moist. Squashes do like a fair amount of water. However, what I discovered during this season after doing this was that the mulch was harboring some of the worst pests of squashes, notably squash bugs and squash beetles. And here is the enemy right here. This is a squash beetle eating one of my squash leaves. And you can see over on the right hand side some of the damage that it's caused. This plus the squash bug in a different order than the beetles caused enormous damage to the leaves of the plants. Squash bugs in particular with their piercing mouth parts open up the leaves not only to damage but also to infection by bacterial diseases which can very quickly kill a squash plant. And so in order to gain control of this substantial problem what I did the following year was something very different. I did not put down mulch, but instead planted between the hills of squash marigold plants and quite a few marigold plants. Marigolds are one of the kinds of plants that helps to discourage insects in the garden. And so as these marigolds matured, they filled up spaces in between the squashes and grew among the squashes. And by eliminating the hiding places of the squash bugs, especially, as well as planting these plants that help to discourage the presence of these insects, I went from having a huge infestation one year to having very few bugs and beetles the following year. Few enough that I was able to control them just with hand picking. Every few days I'd go out and pick any that were still in the garden. And this resulted in a vastly improved harvest of both winter and summer squash. Winter squash are a bit more tolerant of beetle and bug attacks than our summer squash, but even so, the winter squash can be attacked by some of the diseases that follow up on the heels of insects damaging the leaves of the plants. This practice of growing plants to help discourage pests on vegetables is a practice referred to as companion planting. And there's a number of plants that appear to give some benefit in terms of discouraging insects. 
In this photograph here, you'll notice that there are some herbs planted among the vegetable rows. So those white flowering plants next to the tomato plants behind them, that is cilantro. And right in the foreground, just behind those purple leaves, is oregano. And next to that is basil. And so herbs can help with controlling certain kinds of insects. There is some debate about the effectiveness of companion planting, and some research projects have indeed shown that some plants thought to have value as companions don't seem to give as much benefit as people say they do. However, in my own experience, some of these companion plantings do seem to be rather effective at controlling at least certain kinds of insect pests. So we can summarize some of these issues in integrated pest management like this. Companion planting, as we've seen in the previous picture, can help with controlling certain kinds of pests. And then physical barriers, like the row cover you see in the center of this picture here and that we've talked about previously, those can help to keep insect pests from getting on certain kinds of crops, notably things like cabbages and other cabbage relatives, Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and broccoli, all those things that are susceptible to cabbage worms. If the moths can't land on the plants, they can't lay eggs on the plants, and then the cabbage worms are eliminated. But in the background you see a different kind of a physical barrier. You see a fence that goes around this vegetable plantation. This is to keep out larger animals like rabbits and groundhogs. Usually when Putting in a fence, however, it has to be dug into the ground a good foot to keep burrowing animals like groundhogs from going underneath it. A fence does not eliminate climbing animals like raccoons, however, so in that instance, what I've had to go to is an electric fence. Something that, when the raccoon touches it, gives them an unpleasant jolt, and so they won't climb over the fence. Now there are still some other kinds of organic practices which are used in integrated pest management programs. One is called predator reservoirs and that's what I was talking about a while ago. Leaving a row of weeds all the way around the garden, especially certain kinds of weed plants that are known to be habitat for certain kinds of insect predators. So certain kinds of plants are particularly attractive for parasitic wasps to live in. And then from those places, they will go into the garden and attack pests like tomato hornworms. There are also some organic pesticides that have been developed and which are commercially available. Pyrethrins, which is a chemical produced by chrysanthemum plants, is one of those. And in fact, marigolds have a chemical that they produce, which, although it's not pyrethrin, appears to have an action at least somewhat like pyrethrins in terms of controlling insects. Rotenone is another one that is recognized as an organic pesticide derived from a different kind of a plant, although rotenone has been phased out to a significant degree because it does have some substantial toxicity of its own for people handling it, especially men. It's been associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. So it is one that I am reluctant to use. And there are still some other organic pesticides that have been developed, especially for certain kinds of fungal diseases, copper compounds are considered to be organic.
and there are several different kinds of copper compounds that can be sprayed on plants to help control fungal diseases. Another one that I've used for controlling slugs is just plain old household ammonia. And ammonia, of course, once it's applied to the soil, simply is metabolized by bacteria and can be then used by plants. The action of a weak solution of ammonia on slugs is to just directly kill them. And so in wet years when I have slug problems, I'll just go out with my spray bottle of weak ammonia solution. I'll just spray all the slugs I encounter. Most years, in New England at least, slugs are not a big problem. But every once in a while when we have a wet summer, they can become a huge problem. They can simply eliminate plants as they're coming up out of the soil. I've had problems with slugs just completely eliminating all of my beans, for example. And so if I don't control the slugs, I don't get any bean crop. So let's end today by discussing some of the costs and benefits associated with pest and disease control. Now if we are using persistent chemicals, We've already seen some of the downside of that. Toxic effects for wildlife, toxic effects for humans. Although these things might control insects, they are also going to be present as residues in what we eat. As we ascend the food chain, there also tends to be the biomagnification issue with persistent pesticides that they become increasingly concentrated in the tissues of animals at the top of the food chain. Now another issue is that many of these pesticides are not very specific in terms of what they kill. So they kill not only pests but they also kill beneficial insects like honeybees. And of course if you're killing your honeybees then what is there going to be to pollinate your crops? on all those kinds of crops that require insect pollination. Squashes, for example. Not to mention t tomatoes. Then, of course, there is the issue that it costs money to apply these materials to crops. And so the more that we have to use pesticides, the less the return on our investment in terms of growing crops. And on that note, we will end for today, and we will continue on with our discussion of land and water next time.